All right, McKenna, are you ready? I'm ready. Wonderful. All right, everyone online, we're going to get started. Thank you so much for joining us today for HMSC's research seminar. My name is Cinnamon Moffitt, and I am the research program manager at Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center, located in Newport, Oregon, and I will be your host for today's event. Um, just letting you know, this is a um, Zoom event, and so we do have your cameras, mics, and screen shares turned off at this time. We ask that you keep them that way during the course of this event so that those that have limited bandwidth are still able to join us. Um, we do hope that you ask us any questions by using the chat feature in Zoom. You can find that either at the bottom or the top of your screen, depending on what platform you're using. If you click the little pop-out box, you'll get a place where you can type in questions. Um, today's speaker was happy to have you put questions in at any time, and we will get to them at the end of her presentation. I also wanted to let folks know we are recording today's event. Uh, it'll be posted on the HMSC's past uh, seminar page in a few days. I'm gonna put that in the chat in case anybody's curious about finding that. Um, and you can uh, check that out, share it, um, review it if you miss something. So it'll be there for us to be able to see. Uh, one quick announcement before we get started. I wanted to just do a little promo for somebody else that, um, our speaker today might also know. Uh, so next week, same place, same time on April 29th, we have uh, Rainy Oshioka, um, who's going to be joining us also from OIMB at the University of Oregon, who will be talking about doc shrimp. Um, and if they're infected by a particular parasite, are they still considered a shrimp? So that'll be really interesting for us to learn a little bit more about that. If you want to find out anything else about upcoming events at Hatfield, you can go to HMSC's website, scroll to the bottom of the page, um, and there is a calendar of events there where you can get all the login information that you might need. But since we're all here today uh, for a particular reason to learn a little bit more about basket stars, I just wanted to let everybody know that today's speaker, McKenna Haney, has been invited today by Carla Schubinger, who is with OSU's Vet Medicine. Um, and McKenna is here to talk to us today about her work with Basket Stars. But before we jump into all of that, let me give you a little bit of background about McKenna. She's from the Umqua Valley in Southern Oregon. She graduated from the University of Oregon's Oregon Institute of Marine Biology with her bachelor's in marine biology in 2016, and then immediately went back to complete her master's degree, which she completed in 2019. After she graduated, McKenna served as a national service worker with the AmeriCorps, and she was stationed at the Charleston Marine Life Center, where she worked as a marine educator and a medical aquarist. This summer, McKenna will be coming to us um, to start working on her PhD uh, with Carla um, on Pycnopodia and wasting disease. So we're very excited to get a little preview of some of McKenna's work before she comes to us. Um, also just want to promote the fact that, as you can see, her slide up is beautiful. She is a photographer. Her work is um, can be seen at the South Slough Estuary, at Duport's Visual Arts Center, and at the airport. And I'm hoping we're going to see a whole bunch more of those in her presentation today. So, McKenna, the floor is yours. I'll let you take it away. Welcome. Awesome. Thank you for that awesome introduction. And thanks, everybody, for being here today. I am super excited to be able to share some of my research with you all um, and share the love for ophiroids that I have. Um, so with that, I'll get started. And um, my plan for this uh, webinar is to kind of give you a little background to the ophiroid class, just so we're all on the same page. Um, they tend to be uh, kind of skimmed over a little bit, so you may or may not know about them, but having everybody on the same page before we get going is always great. Um, so with that, uh, what are brittle stars or what are ophiroids? So um, ophiroids is a class of echinoderms, and this encompasses your brittle stars, your basket stars, and your serpent stars. Um, it's a misconception that they are Starfish, um, they're not sea stars or starfish. Those are asteroids. Um, and again, they're members of the phylum Echinodermata. Um, the name Ophiroid can be broken down into its Greek origins. 
called Ophis, means serpent, and uh, it's pretty applicable across all cases here, whether we're talking about brittle stars, serpent stars, or basket stars. Um, and But all of these animals share the same basic body plan of having that main central disc with five arms coming out of it. So what makes an ophiroid an echinoderm? Um, they need to meet certain criteria and have distinct characteristics, including um, heteroradial symmetry as an adult, uh, bilaterally symmetric larva. They have a water vascular system, which all of their chromosomes do. They have a calcareous endoskeleton uh, made of ossicles. Hold on to that word, ossicles. That'll be a main theme uh, in my research toward the end of this presentation. Uh, they have mutable collagenous tissue, which is a special tissue type um, that allows echinoderms to rapidly drop arms or other parts of their body. And this is probably where brittle stars got their name um, for their aptitude to quickly and readily drop their arms. And they are deuterostomes, which is a fancy way of saying during embryonic development, the, the mouth forms second to the anus. And we are also deuterostomes. And ophiroids have been on Earth for a long, long time. Um, the modern ophiroid ancestor emerged somewhere around um, the early Ordovician period, which is about 500 million years ago. Uh, so that's a really long time ago. It's before dinosaurs were around and before even early shark predecessors were around. Um, so next time you see a brittle star, just know that you are looking at um, a living, like a living fossil. They are really an old group and their body plan hasn't changed much through time. It's been a very successful body plan and they've stuck with it. Um, today, there are about 1900 extant species and we find their fossil assemblages uh, with trilobites quite often. Um, there's a photo of that on the left-hand side. Uh, so one of the questions I get a lot is how do they eat? Well, their mouth is on the underside of that central body disc and ophiroids in general utilize several different modes of feeding. So I'll quickly go over those. Uh, the first one is deposit feeding. And this is where brittle stars would like scoot around the bottom and collect detritus with their tube feet, package it up nicely with mucus, and then shuttle that mucus ball with food to their mouth with their tube feet on the underside of their disc. Then you have uh, your suspension feeders, uh, which you know, classic examples are basket stars, of course, and many members of the Ophiothrix genus, uh, like the spiny brittle star in the right bottom corner there, are suspension feeders. And they utilize a strong ocean current to bring food to them. Um, and they look quite you know, beautiful and delicate and they utilize this current as a food shuttle system, but they are capable of handling larger prey, um, not only plankton, but krill and small fish. And to do that, um, basket stars in particular utilize uh, hooks that line their arms um, each one of those bifurcated arms is lined with rings of hooks and uh, they kind of look like, or they do look like this. These are my uh, light microscopy images in the middle there and my scanning electron images of basket star arm hooks on the right. And they're very strong. They're able to pierce uh, crustacean carapaces like krill and they're able to pin down active swimmers like fish. Um, and while I was looking at these under different types of microscopes, I thought this structure looked kind of similar to something I had seen before. Um, and that's when I realized that they look just like a cat claw and they even function just like a cat claw. So they have um, those abducting, adducting muscles on either side of that like, lever joint. Um, and they're able to move each hook individually with those muscles. Um, which is amazing to think about because they can also move each tendril, um, each arm tendril individually. So they've got basket stars have 
these crazy bifurcating arms that are lined with hooks. And if that wasn't enough, um, they can also secrete a paralyzing mucus um, to further subdue their prey. So these beautiful, uh, rather peaceful looking animals are pretty badass on the microscopic level. And that's one of the reasons why I love them so much. Um, and then the last um, feeding mode that I'll quickly cover is the sit and wait predators and the scavengers. Um, so larger brittle stars are able to opportunistically snag prey, um, prey that are quite large, like a squid on the right hand side. There's a YouTube video that goes with these photos taken by a sub, um, a submersible vehicle of these brittle stars using a mobbing behavior to take down this large squid and devour it alive. And then other brittle stars like the tropical giant green brittle star on the left, which can um, make a cave look very cave-like cavern with its body, very appealing to fish looking for a place to hide. Um, and then slowly crank their arms together, closing the gaps, trapping the fish, which it then also devours alive. So again, move over sharks. These brittle stars and ophiroids, I hope, are your new favorite ocean predator. Um, I also get asked about reproduction when it comes to brittle stars, and most are gonoparistic, which means they have separate sexes, but um, there are plenty of examples of uh, hermaphroditic individuals, uh, species within this class. Most are free spawning, which means they um, spawn out their eggs and sperm into the water column and have that fertilization happen in the water. However, some species, like Astroclamys here, uh, retains their eggs and has internal, internal fertilization, um, and they'll brood their young, which then crawl out. Um, and then even an even cooler way of reproduction is through physiparity, and that's division through fission. So um, this comes in handy when considering predation. Uh, crabs like to eat brittle stars, and they'll often get pinched in half with those scale heads. And they'll eat one half of the brittle star. The other brittle star half will crawl away, live another day, and regenerate the missing parts. Um, so that's another mode of reproduction there. Um, they have this really cool iconic larva called the Ophiopluteus. And you can tell the difference between Ophiopludii and Echinopludii by looking at the larval arms. Um, Ophiopludii have these really iconic long larval antennae like arms that stick out um, like a beacon telling you that you're looking at an ophiroid larvae. Uh, however, some are direct developers and don't have this larval uh, pluteus form. They kind of look like little blobs. And we have two examples of those species here on our coast, including Amphiodia and the basket star goes on a succulent. Um, going back to brooding a little bit, uh, some species brood, which eliminates the risk of getting eaten in the plankton or um, getting eaten while like, trying to settle on the seafloor. Um, however, the trade-off is fewer, um, fewer are able, fewer offspring are able to be produced each breeding season. Um, and there's this really cool study done by Lanshoff and Griffiths in 2015 that used ultrasound and um, x-rays to produce 3D images of what this brooding looks like and where these offspring are placed within the adult body. Um, and it turns out the offspring are brooded in chambers called bursi, which um, are another important structure which become a major theme of my research, which I'll talk about next. So the bursae are little chambers that open into the body disc of the uh, ophiroid or brittle star. And there are 10 of them. They're paired. So there's one on either side of each arm. And some functions that uh, we knew for sure before I started my research, um, that the bursae do are waste product removal, like metabolites, 
um, of course, juvenile brooding and gamete expulsion. That's where the gametes leave the body. Um, and then oxygen exchange and a respiratory function was suggested. It was first suggested in a text from the late 1800s and then never really touched after that. Um, so that quickly became one of my questions and I'll talk about that a little later. So uh, all of my research happened at the University of Oregon's Institute of Marine Biology in Dr. Emlet's lab. Um, and a small portion uh, that was complementary to the research I did here happened at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Boca del Toro. Uh, that's Panama. So as an undergrad, um, I was immediately drawn to basket stars, um, like most people. Um, and I really enjoyed watching them eat. And I was fascinated you know, watching them and drawing them and seeing them figure out how to like use each arm to gather plankton and uh, take it to their mouth. And like in researching this, I found that several descriptions in the literature, but there were no images, no drawings, no videos to go with this description. So one of the first things that I did was provide a series of photographs and some videos of this feeding behavior. Um, and with the help of time-lapse recording with the GoPro and using a camera and some mirror tricks to get uh, shots of the underside of the mouth, I was able to get this feeding sequence, and you can see that in the left-hand image, A through D. Um, and what they basically do is grab plankton out of the water column. And when they think they've grabbed enough, um, they will bring the arm down to the mouth, stick the arm into the mouth, and wipe off the plankton across their uh, bristling mouth, which is pretty cool. And then on the right-hand side here, it's a photo that I kind of find humorous. Um, it's a great example of a basket star absolutely stuffing its face mouth. Um, so it's a very happy basket star right there. So my interest began with the speeding behavior. And I mentioned that I was using time-lapse recording to watch what they were doing because they kind of moved slowly in real time. Um, and when I was looking at these videos, I noticed a movement of the disc that um, was really interesting and I didn't know what it was. So I will play this video. And that movement you guys should pay attention to is of the body disc and this uh, pumping or uh, ventilating movement. So I'll play that now. There goes the food. you can see that body disc making that um, kind of like a billows movement. So I was really captivated with this behavior. Um, and so I went to the literature to try to figure out what it was. Um, again, there wasn't very much in the literature there were no modern descriptions of this behavior, but I came across a term called bursal ventilation. Um, and it was for a different smaller brittle star species, but it seemed to fit um, what this basket star was doing. And basically it described that the body disc will inflate, drawing water into the bursi, and then it will deflate and expel that water from the bursi. And it's a cyclical um, ongoing behavior that they do. So I had already started feeding experiments and I wanted to check out what feeding, um, if feeding had a uh, impact on this bursal ventilation rate. So I started with nine individual basket stars. Um, I put them into a controlled tank one after the next and um, use time-lapse videography to film them when they were not feeding and when they were feeding. And 
uh, using those recordings, I was able to calculate the bursal ventilation rates um, and compare those rates between feeding and non-feeding individuals. And what I found is that bursal ventilation significantly increases when these animals are actively feeding. Um, and as you saw, when they are actively feeding, they wave their arms around, they can scoot around the tank a little bit. Um, and all of that movement is done by muscles, which we know um, when muscles uh, do action, they consume more oxygen. Um, this would make sense that um, a brittle star feeding would have a higher need for oxygen, um, which led me to believe that maybe bursal ventilation does indeed have a um, respiratory, does have a um, use in the respiratory pathway. So this was the end of my undergraduate research and I still had questions. I wanted to know what this bursal ventilation rate did in the absence of food um, and in changing oxygen concentrations. So as a master's student, I asked the question, um, does bursal ventilation rate change in different oxygen concentrations? Um, so I repeated, and, well, I started a new experiment, sort of similar to the last one with 12 new basket stars. Um, and then on this graph, there are two specimens uh, representative of the 12. But what I did in this experiment is placed a basket star in a controlled aquarium, um, filmed with time lapse during a normoxic period, so when the oxygen level is normal, and then induced a hypoxic state of oxygen by bubbling nitrogen gas into the aquarium. Um, and this displaces the oxygen with nitrogen without significantly altering pH. Um, and then I would film uh, a hypoxic period for 30 minutes. And then after that, uh, crank on the aerators, get that oxygen back into the water to create a post-hypoxic, normoxic um, period of the last 30 minutes. Um, and I would film with time lapse during this whole sequence and use that uh, recording to calculate bursal ventilation rate during normoxic, hypoxic, and post-hypoxic periods. And what I found is that all 12 specimens had a very similar um, rate traje trajectory that was almost completely inverse to the oxygen concentration, uh, which you can kind of see on this graph here. Um, when I ran the statistics on this data, um, it showed that yes, there was a significant increase in bursal ventilation rate when the oxygen was lowered to hypoxic levels. And across all 12 individuals, they showed a 60% average increase in bursal ventilation rate when the oxygen concentration goes down to hypoxic levels. So it seems like they are trying to compensate um, their ability to extract oxygen out of the water with an increased rate of ventilation. Um, so this lended significant support to our hypothesis that bursal ventilation does in fact um, serve as a means of respiration, but we wanted to find out if oxygen is actively being taken up within the bursae. Uh, so that was our next experiment. And to do this, um, water samples were taken directly from the bursae with a modified syringe um, after the water had been in them for about 30 seconds. Um, and then that water sample was measured uh, for oxygen concentration and compared with tube controls and ambient water samples from the uh, tanks that they were in. And not surprisingly, um, there was a lower oxygen concentration in the bursae samples, which suggests oxygen molecules were actively being taken up within those structures. Um, and I mentioned earlier that I not only worked on basket stars, but also a couple of brittle stars. Um, I was lucky enough to get 
a California native brittle star ship to me called Ophiothrix spiculata from a uh, warmer temperate climate. And then uh, when I went to Panama to do some work, I was able to utilize their local species of Ophiothrix, um, Ophiothrix swensoni. And when I did these experiments using these two separate species, um, the rates were different from, um, the rate magnitude was different from the basket star. However, the same um, rate trajectory was shown and you can kind of see that on these graphs here that the rate goes up by almost 60% on both of these species in hypoxic uh, exposure. Uh, so that was a really cool finding. Um, and I used the Ophiothrix genus because it was mentioned in some of the only available literature that they also did this bursal ventilation behavior. Um, so that was really awesome that I was able to find both a warm temperate and a tropical species in this genus that was known to exhibit this behavior. Um, so that was the rationale for using these two and comparing them with a basket star. So after doing all these experiments, I had this question about like, why would this ability to um, try to regulate respiration evolve and persist in not only a cold temperate species, basket star, uh, but also a warm temperate species from California and a tropical species from Panama. And one of the themes that uh, all of these had in common is that their locations that they can be found in all experience periodic exposure to hypoxia or seasonal hypoxia like we do along our coast. Um, so perhaps having the ability to regulate their respiration in temporary low oxygen um, could have made the difference between surviving a low oxygen event or not surviving a low oxygen event. And um, that ability would be supported by the evolutionary process. And um, looking at their fossil records, there is some evidence for this. Um, there's certainly evidence for historical hypoxia in areas where brittle stars existed. Um, and a behavior has been cemented in time in these fossils that um, Modern ophioids do this cool behavior where when they are exposed to really low oxygen, they will stand up on their tiptoes. Um, and then if they can't get out of that oxygen, of course they will die. But before they die, they flip themselves over and uh, they'll die mouth side up. And this is really important um, because when we find ophioid assemblages, uh, some of them, uh, most of the brittle stars in that um, fossil sample have all died mouth side up. And the sediment chemistry alongside those fossils suggests that when that layer was formed, it was formed in a low oxygen environment, um, suggesting that um, fossil brittle stars were exposed to hypoxic events uh, through geologic time. And um, if you want to know the nitty gritty details and want to read more about this work, um, you can find our publication in the June 2020 issue of the Biological Bulletin. Um, and there's the DOI if you want to go read it. So that uh, brings us up to speed on chapters basically one through three of my master's program research. And the next chapter, like chapter four, was kind of my part two. And I was interested in how the anatomy worked to make this behavior of bursal ventilation possible. Um, again, there were virtually no descriptions for these species in the literature. And I decided, hey, why not fill that gap? Um, so I set off to describe the anatomy and figure out how it worked. So, like most things when you're trying to figure out how things work, whether it's car engines or anatomy, first you have to take them apart and reassemble them. Um, so I had uh, preserved some animals that did not make it over the years, um, basket stars and both Ophiothrix species. 
Um, and the workflow for processing these animals to look at their ossicles, which again is their hard um, endoskeleton, um, is you take a section of your part of interest and then you wash it with bleach, a bleach solution to get the soft tissue off. Um, and you can do this a number of times to where you get the dermis off, but the muscles remain. And if you keep going, the muscles will go eventually and you'll just be left with ossicles. Um, so after the bleach, bleach washing, um, I would either look at them under a light microscope and then draw my observations or uh, pick a select few ossicles and uh, use, look at them with scanning electron microscopes. And I did this for basket stars and the two other ophiophrysids. But we'll start with the basket star. So the two big players in this um, bursal ventilation movement are these crazy looking ossicles called the radial shield and the genital plate. And the radial shields can be seen from the top of the animal. Um, our species along our coast at least has uh, peach colored stripes that correlate where those radial shields are under the dermis. So they're pretty easy to see their position in the body. Um, and once the soft tissue was washed away, I found that they were held, these two ossicles were held together with an adductor and an abductor muscle. And they have they're complete with muscle attachment sites and articulating surfaces. And the genital plate is uh, fixed to the arm of the basket star. So that plate doesn't move, but that it serves as an anchor for the radial shield to make those movements off of. Um, and while I was looking at the basket star ossicles, I noticed this really interesting feature on the genital plate ossicle. And that is this really uh, dome shaped condyle. It's labeled number one on the screen. Um, and this huge round surface is seems to be unique, not only to basket stars, but maybe to this species. And it was so special, I thought it deserved a name. It didn't have a name yet. And I was trying to come up with something. And I knew I had seen the shape before, um, but I just couldn't place it until I looked in a um, ecology book. And sure enough, this shape popped up. And I thought this shape was a dead ringer for uh, Darwin's bald head. So um, I named this uh, ossicle feature Darwin's calvaria. Cal calvaria is a fancy word for a skull cap. Um, just because of its uncanny resemblance to his very bald head. Um, so I hope that name sticks in the anatomy books. Um, I took SEM images of these ossicles, but for basket stars, these ossicles were so huge, they had to be broken to fit into the field of view for the scanning electron microscope. Um, but when I was looking at these, I was really fascinated with the different uh, pore diameters of this stereome. And ossicles are made of this um, fabric type of stereome. And it's just the pattern that the cells that create this calcium carbonate um, down to make the ossicles. But they do it in different shapes and diameters. And I was fascinated with the difference in these diameters and where they were located. And it turns out that the pore diameters are much, much smaller at muscle attachment sites and on articulating surfaces. So you can see here, here's a muscle attachment site and an articulating area. And over here, here's a muscle attachment breast, articulating area and a muscle attachment site. And those pores are really, really small. Um, and it turns out that these are, you know, they're hard bony parts, so they preserve well in the fossil record. Um, and I'm hoping that you, uh, paleobiologists will be able to use this information uh, when looking at brittle star ossicle fossils to infer where muscle sites uh, 
were and where articulating areas were and be able to use this to inform um, function from form. And since DNA extraction is sometimes not possible with fossils, um, morphological characteristics have to be used to make phylogenies. So I'm hoping that um, these descriptions and these clues in the fossil record can help provide information to building phylogenies of fossil species as well. Um, so I did this for the two other Ophiothracid species, um, Ophiotherix swensoni and Spiculata, uh, starting with biological illustrations from the light microscope images. Um, the radial shields, um, these guys were more triangular, very um, kind of wing-like, and the genital plates were still elongated, um, but very different from the basket star genital plates. Um, and they were connected by the same two muscles and worked in the general same way as basket star. And here are the uh, scanning electron photographs of those guys. And um, you can see there's a muscle attachment site here with those really dense small pores. Um, same thing here and then down here as well and here. So that basically wrapped up chapter four and wrapped up my research um, as a master's student in that lab. So some select conclusions from these studies that we came to is that because versatile ventilation rate increased an average of 60% um, during exposure to hypoxic conditions, um, and that we saw oxygen levels in versal water samples were much lower than ambient samples. Uh, this strongly suggests that um, not only is oxygen taken up within the bursae, but that this versal ventilation behavior does indeed serve as a means of respiration for um, the basket star, Gorgonocephalus, and the two Ophiophrysid species. Um, then second, when looking at um, SEM photos and looking at stereome fabrics, so the density of that calcium carbonate, uh, we can infer where the muscle attachment sites are and where the articulating surfaces are and infer, infer uh, function from form. And then lastly, um, these, model, these modern ossicle characteristics can apply to fossil ossicles and may be able to be utilized to inform uh, function from form and help morphology-based phylogenetic decisions. So I'm hoping these findings can contribute to those future findings. Then a last note on why they matter. Um, ophiroids are the most numerous class of echinoderms and they are found in virtually every ocean of our world. And sometimes they literally carpet the biome that they exist in, uh, like the two bottom photographs of a temperate reef and a deep sea biome. Um, they are food for many animals, including sea otters that love to eat basket star roe, uh, crabs love to eat brittle stars, and there are even some fish that will eat them as well, uh, including several rockfish species we have on our coast. Um, and echinoderms as a group produce almost 1 trillion kilograms of calcium carbonate per year. So they're major contributors to the calcium carbonate cycle in our ocean. Um, and without them, surely that calcium carbonate cycle and ocean chemistry would be altered slightly. Um, so they do matter and they're often overlooked in ecological studies. So I am hoping that after this talk, you will go share the wonderful things you've learned about brittle stars and why they are special and why us curious humans should care about them a little bit more. So uh, with that, I'd be happy to take your questions. Um, if you think of anything later, you can always email me. Uh, my email's in the bottom left-hand corner, and I also answer messages on my Instagram and on Twitter. And with that, uh, oh, happy Earth Day. Um, yeah, so 
Thank you so very much. Um, you definitely got reactions when you uh, told us about the skull cap. So I don't know if you saw it, but uh, people were enjoying that. So it's hard when you don't get interaction from the audience to know uh, when things land. Um, but thank you very much, McKenna. I uh, appreciate that a lot. If folks have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. If you'd rather ask them out loud, just let me know either in the chat or raise your hand and I can um, unmute you and you can ask your questions that way. Um, and while folks are kind of getting their questions together, I had a question for you, McKenna, and this is just a basic one. Um, how long do the basket stars hold their embryos in the brooding before they are released? Do we know? Um, they seem to be yearly producers. Um, so the gonads seem to grow year round and then they release them in January, February. Okay, and then a question's coming in. Um, do we know how long the basket stars live on average? No, um, that is another question I'm working on. Um, they do this interesting growth pattern on their ossicles where they lay down rings, kind of like tree rings. And I took a bunch of data from all these different uh, basket stars and I'm trying to correlate the yearly growth to ring pattern. So um, I may have the answer to that question in the coming years, but I don't right away. I hypothesize that they're fairly long lived, um, maybe even up to 30 years. Nice. So everyone uh, stay tuned for that question. Um, if you're not seeing it too, McKenna, you're getting lots of thank yous. That was outstanding. Uh, nice job in the chat. So virtual claps there. Um, so I have another, I, I like basket stars. I have another question. Um, how many uh, juveniles can they uh, hold in the, the sack? Is it just one per? Oh, multiples. A, we know. That's a hard question. So they have, um, one gonad sac in each bursi and 10 bursi. Uh, so that's 10 sacs and probably 100 to 200 eggs if they're female in each sac. So maybe up to 2000 um, potential eggs for fertilization. Um, males, I mean, sperm are really tiny. So it's anybody's guess how much sperm a male basket star could have. Nice. Um, so another question, you talked about um, hypoxia. Do you know about the effects of acidification on respiration? I don't. Um, in fact, I designed my experiments to avoid pH changes because that would be a confounding factor. Um, so I don't actually know that question. My theory is that it might be a potential stressor, um, which might induce a higher rate of respiration, uh, but I don't really know that, but that's my thought. Nice. Giving a little awkward pause. If anyone has any other questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat or let us know. Otherwise, um, McKenna has done a great job of leaving her information up on the screen. So if you have questions specific for her um, that you don't wanna ask uh, right now, you can uh, contact her by email. And hopefully by this summer, um, we may be able to be around each other a little bit more and be at Hatfield and McKenna might be there. So you might be able to talk to her in the halls um, as she's going to be spending a little bit more time with us. So uh, I think with that, I'm just gonna say thank you so much for sharing with us. And again, your pictures are amazing. I just got a question in. Yeah. Um, how do you measure DO in such a small volume of water? Yeah, so um, if you're talking about like the syringe samples, my oxygen meter conveniently just fit in the syringe. Um, <laughs> it was really, it was a nice fit. Um, and I was able to get accurate readings by just putting my DO meter in that syringe. Um, and then of course that's what the control tube was for is making sure those were accurate readings. Um, nice. And then, you know, the DO meter easily fits in the tank, so. It's serendipitous, the volumes are, are yeah. incredible. It was very nice and done. Um, all right, so again, I just wanna thank everybody for joining us. I hope you join us next week uh, when we get to learn a little bit more about Doc Shrimp. So feel free to come back. Um, and McKenna, thank you so much for spending your time with us and sharing your work. We're excited to have you come and join the Hatfield family. So yeah. thank you very much. Thank you. 
All right, everybody. Thank you so much. We'll see you next week. Bye, McKenna. Bye.